freedom bringing victory and strength Jesus precious Jesus you bring life beyond the
over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is how Your name is He Every heart and every mind 
Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Amen. We're going to take communion together this morning. You might have seen when you walked in, there's a cup on your seat. If you want to turn around and grab that, open it up. We do this together as a church to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. We remember that he died on the cross, that he shed his blood for us so that we may receive grace, that we may receive forgiveness, that we could be washed clean of our sin, of our shame, of our guilt. So Lord, we come before you this morning with gratitude, Jesus. Help us to sit with the weight of what you've done and with the true gift that we can receive from you, Jesus. It's in your name that we receive healing. It is in your name that we can proclaim your victory over darkness, Jesus because of what you did on that cross and the fact that you rose again three days later, Lord. We thank you for what you have poured out for us. And we thank you for what you have overcome, God. So Lord, we humbly come before you this morning. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. And we continue to praise you in your holy name, Jesus' name. Take some time to pray and receive the elements.
Lord, we thank you that you reign above it all, Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us and we can rejoice in your victory, Jesus, as we stand before you, God, with the most gratitude, with the most humility, God. Shape us, form us as we continue to worship you and praise you with our whole life. It's in your name we pray, amen. 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 Good morning. What an awesome way to start off the day. So good to worship with you all. My name is Katie. I'm on staff here at Branches. I'm so glad that you're here. Before we continue, would you turn to someone next to you and introduce yourself and really meet them? Ask them a question. We'll spend some time. break you up. <laughs> well, good morning. My name is Lisa. I'm the mission and women's pastor here. Hello. I, <laughs> hi Whitney. I get to invite you all into this next portion of our worship service as we worship God with our tithes and offering. And so whether you give as a basket passes by you or whether you give online you can participate even now by just saying thank you Jesus thank you for how you have provided for me and so we will have baskets pass by in a little bit um, as y'all tithe you may not know this some of you are newer branches takes 10% of the whole tithe and we put it into an account called first fruits and then we tithe out into the community into our mission partners and being on missions, I get like this front row seat to seeing what God is doing. And let me tell you, he's moving. Locally, in Kenya, in Ecuador, I was on a Zoom call with all the partners, the Vishers, the Coxes, local, last Tuesday, and I was just humbled and in tears. Um, these people are sitting with some really hurting people. They're sitting with people con contemplating suicide, people in poverty, orphans, widows, teen parents. Like, they're sitting in it. And God is moving. God is saving lives. And I want you all to know that because as you tithe, you get to play a part of that. You get to help God's kingdom expand. So these stories, they reignite my faith. If you're like, I need to be reminded of what God's doing, find me, email me. I want to get you connected with these partners so you can hear stories firsthand and get reignited and see what God is doing outside the walls of branches. So I'm going to pray for us. God, we thank you that you do provide so well for us. I thank you for the generosity of this church, God. Would you bless and multiply the gifts, God? Would you multiply what you're doing out and about in Huntington and beyond, God? We are humbled and privileged. Lord, thank you for calling each of us into what you've called us into. Just ask that you continue um, to bless the rest of this service. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Okay, some announcements are gonna play. I totally encourage you to pay attention because we've got some good stuff going on and we don't want you to miss it. Hey church, I'm Brian Albright, one of the worship pastors here at Branches. And I wanna remind you about our Wednesday morning prayer gatherings going on for the duration of Lent. Lent is a 40-day season in the church calendar, and it's marked by reflection, prayer, and fasting leading up to Easter Sunday. And during this season, we've been gathering for worship and prayer every Wednesday morning from 7.30 to 8.30 here at the warehouse. This is an intentional hour to worship and be prompted to remember the cross leading up to Easter weekend, and simply to pray over our church and city. If you haven't joined us yet, 
I wanna encourage you to step into this new rhythm. Even if it's just for one week as a way to reset, dig deeper with God and contend for our church in prayer. Bring a jacket though, because it can get cold in the mornings and you might be surprised how refreshing and reorienting spending an hour with God can be to start your day. Tomorrow night, we're hosting a workshop for all ages on Jesus' Great Commission and how every Christian is called to make disciples. This isn't exclusive to pastors or church leaders, but is the call for everyone who follows Jesus. So join us tomorrow night, Monday, February 26th at 6.30 p.m. at the warehouse, and we'll be discussing why we disciple, how to begin, where we should disciple, and other practical insights on discipleship in general. We'll be interviewing three people in our community about their personal experience in discipleship, taking a look at various life stages on how God works through them. The greatest investments we can make with our lives is what goes beyond our lives and into the next, making disciples as Jesus calls us to. So we hope you can make it. And don't forget, next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month. And what does that mean? Potluck Sunday, as well as collecting food donations for the Oakview neighborhood. So we wanna see you at the Senior Center between our services. You can find the list of needed food donations at our connection table for the Oakview Food Pantry. Also be sure to bring a side dish for our potluck and share the wealth with our community. Continuing with our theme of food, we also host branches nights here at the warehouse on the first Sunday of the month. Dinner's at 5.30, the service is at 6.30, and these nights feature brand new teachers that we want to feature in our community and give them time to preach and teach where we can actually grow and develop more as a community of believers. So join us the first Sunday of each month as we kick off the month together. All right, that's it for me. Would you welcome up Pastor Andrew as we continue our series in First Group? All righty, good morning. Good to see all of you. Uh, you know, it's uh, the eve of March, right? We're about to step into March. It feels like spring has sprung. Uh, we've had the rains, kind of like spring rains. The flowers are in bloom. My eyes are on fire already. Yeah, uh, spring uh, sports is in full effect for the Shea family household. Way too many sports. Way too many sports. You know, I... I, I, I've heard there's a lot of programming in church, you know, like there's a lot of things that go on. I don't want to hear that anymore because kids' sports is like a multiple on church programming. I mean, I think for baseball alone, it's about four, four days this week of stuff. Uh, that's the amount of programming. So I don't know how I'm going to do this. I understand why like 99% of the team's families are not in church. You couldn't do it. What am I going to do? I've got to be in that. I've got to be in this. I'm going to run from this to that right after this is over. I mean, this is the frame of mindset. I mean, my wife, God bless her, Whitney, she was gone for four days. You guys know I've got five kids. Gone for four days. The only way I'm still alive is my mother-in-law. God bless Petra, my mother-in-law. I don't know if she's here this morning. This might be TMI, all right? But guys, I'm, I'm just trying to say, like, this is what I'm walking in here with. I don't know what you're walking in here with. I don't know what your week was like. I don't know what the week you're stepping into is like. You know what's so great is this is the first day of the week, and this is the first thing we're doing on the first day of the week. We're coming together in worship. Isn't that cool? We get to, we get to come together on the first day of the week, first thing we do. We've all made a decision. We're going to open God's Word, and we're going to be molded by it, and we're going to be given vision from it. That is so refreshing. That's so rejuvenating. That's what I need. I don't know if that's what you need this morning, but thankfully, that's what we're going to be stepping into. We're in 1 Corinthians, if you want to open there, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you would like, I'm not sure can pass you a Bible so that you can open up with us and, and read along. If you've been around in this series, you know that we've been dealing with the same subject for a long time. I've told you many times that there's pride and self-promotion that was going on in the First Corinthian church that was breaking down the fellowship. Guys and gals were going around thinking, oh, I'm endowed with this special knowledge, I'm endowed with these special abilities, and that was splitting the church into these different factions gathered around various personalities. And Paul has been responding to that quality, to that pride, that ego, all the way back since the second half of chapter one. So we're in the second half of chapter four, and we're still dealing with the same subject. He's been taking out the hammer of truth and breaking up 
that ego in the church. Now, about a week and a half ago, I started breaking out our countertops or granite countertops. Just get the hammer. There's no turning back once you start beating that counter. And, and you know, it's interesting. You hit it a few times, and it's like nothing happens. You know, slam, slam, slam. And, you know, you can't really see the difference, but these little cracks kind of start to emerge. But then one time you hit it, and it's like, pop, it just breaks off. And there's a huge chunk. And I feel like that's what Paul's been doing on this topic of pride and ego. He's been hitting that, you know, ego, the pride, that slab of pride in the church. And it's had all these cracks for the last couple chapters. And now we're going to see, like, whole pieces of the church's self-understanding break off. And he's going to get to the heart of what this Christianity thing is supposed to be about. What it's really about at the core. Let's read together. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 8. You know, it's just, it's just one of those days I woke up and I broke my glasses, the arm on the glasses, so I'm going to look like this, which is just great. You know, that, that's, that's just where I'm at, guys. You know, I'm, we're just being real here today. There's, there's no pride. I almost fell coming into first service. I tripped on the cords and almost ate it. I would have just laid there. I wouldn't have got back up. That's just where I'm at. I'm not in this place here that he's dealing with, Lord willing. Let's read chapter 4, verse 8. The verses will be on the screens. Paul says, Already you have all you want. Already you become rich. You begun to reign, and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign, so that we might also reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have as many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing, and then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love with a gentle spirit? There you have it, pretty spicy, am I, am I right? I mean, it's not often that you do a reading of the Bible and you walk away, you know, having heard this sort of tone. Paul's ranting a bit, isn't he? He's pretty sarcastic, he's pretty sardonic, and I, and I get the use of these rhetorical tools. It's like when there's this accepted reality in culture that's just so preposterous, you have to mock it for what it is. It's absurd. Like, you remember when they closed the beaches for a half minute during COVID? <laughs> yeah, you know, the engine's already getting warmed up here. We're already getting a little angry. You know, you just, you just want to thank the government for looking out for us, right? You just want to say, thank you so much for keeping us from the freshest air. Thank you. I really didn't need that vitamin D. I'm so glad you kept me from those positive mental health vibes. That's not what we needed during that period of time, right? That's sarcasm in response to the absurd. To Paul, it is the absolute heights of absurdity. That these Christians, these followers of Christ, I mean, that's their name, that we're carrying Christian, are wholesale embracing these attitudes of the world and becoming in some way proud. It doesn't fit the setting. It doesn't fit the people that they're supposed to be. Remember many years back, I traveled to Uganda on a ministry trip, and as we're coming in, you see on the tarmac all these baboons on the tarmac. And then they're actually all outside the terminal as well and coming into like, the food court area. And, you know, you'd see these uniformed military with machine guns 
and everything's normal. That's normal there. None of the guys with the machine gun shot up the baboons. I mean, they just kind of let them come in and out. Oh, yeah, yeah, they just live here too. In that setting and place and time, that's what normal is. If that was going on in LAX, I'd think I'm in the movie Jumanji. You know, it just doesn't fit the setting in the place and time. And so when we talk about pride, when we talk about ego, yeah, sure, in the world, it fits. It's normal. It's commonplace. You should expect that. But when it comes to the people of God, when it comes to the church, it's entirely out of place. And yet Paul references no less than three things these Corinthian Christians were deriving pride from in verse 8. He says, already you have all you want. Literally, you have fed yourself to the point of being full. That's what the word means. He says, you're rich. Already you've begun to reign. So we've got comfort. We've got wealth and influence that was feeding their pride. I mean, what does these sort of realities do to our souls? What does comfort do for our soul? Well, it teaches our soul that our surroundings are there to serve our own interests. That's what comfort does for our soul. Ask anyone who's been in the service industry and waited on extremely wealthy people. You know, not everybody who's extremely wealthy does the same things, but I guarantee you, people in the service industry who've worked with really wealthy people at a resort or a nice restaurant, they'll tell you a story about the time, you know, the guy threw the cappuccino at them because it was one degree off. You know, oh, this is supposed to be 140, and it's 141, this is putrid. You know, because comfort does that to the soul. It trains us to think that our surroundings are there to serve us. What does wealth do for our soul? How does it condition us? It makes us feel secure. That's why when people have a lot of money, they have, what do we say? We say financial security. What does an abundance of influence do for our soul? Well, it makes us feel like we're somebody because other people are saying we're somebody. Now, the key word on each of these that I just talked about that I used is feel. Comfort, wealth, influence, they make us feel things. But they don't fundamentally change us and who we actually are. Fame doesn't make us somebody because it's fleeting. Wealth doesn't make us secure because it cannot buy the future. And being comfortable certainly doesn't mean the universe certainly changes its whole purpose and meaning to suddenly just serve our individual interests. But if their ego and their sense of self were a balloon, then these three realities are the air that's filling up that pride, the wealth, the influence, the comfort. It's just filling and filling and filling. That's what the word arrogant means that Paul has now used twice to describe some of those in the Corinthian church in this letter to this point. It literally means to be puffed up. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a bird, you know, fluff up its feathers, and it becomes like twice the size. You know, but if you pluck off the feathers, you ever seen that? Don't Google it. It's not pretty. But Paul says that's who they really are. When you take the feathers off, when you take off all the extra stuff, it's like my dog, very long-haired dog, goes to the groomer after he gets some mats. When it gets too long, it's shaved down. Even my dog acts like he's embarrassed when he comes back. Even he seems a little, I didn't know dogs were this self-aware, but he seems a little insecure when you shave off that coat. That's them in reality, under that big coat of ego. Paul quips in verse 9 that it sure would be nice if they were actually all the things that they act like they are, if they were actually rulers, because he might join them. Seeing as their experience of following Jesus is so different than his experience of being an apostle of Jesus, one sent on a mission by God. Paul Paul saw himself in verse 9 as one who'd been put by God on display at the end of the procession like one condemned to die in the arena. And that's what they would do in the ancient world. They'd all, you know, line up in town like it's the HB 4th of July parade, and everyone would be there, and then the Roman ruler would, you know, have this, like, procession go down the middle of town, where after a military victory, he'd show all the spoils of war. Hey, this is all the stuff that we've taken back from our conquest. And at the very end of the line would be the prisoners of war. It would be the people in shackles who were going to go die in the Colosseum for sport. That's where Paul saw himself. Not in the high places, but in the low places. And that's how he was treated as a Christian and as an apostle. Now, it's hard for us to conceive of the setting in which Paul was ministering, living as we do in a world where 2.2 billion people claim to be Christians. But in Paul's day, Christianity was generally ignored, unknown, or wildly unpopular. Christians were, you know, a civil nuisance to the Romans and were considered blasphemers by the Jews. 
So that's why Paul was often run out of town because of his message. He got whipped and beat to the brink of death. And eventually, tradition tells us, he did die by beheading in Rome. But like we see in Paul's example, if we do something when it's difficult or when it's not accepted or when it's uncool, we're doing it then only because we really believe in it. It's like those of you who rollerblade. Sorry, I, you know, I'm just jealous of you. I didn't learn to ride a bike till I was 18, so there's that. Let me knock myself down a couple notches. But when I say that, I'm talking about motive. You know, I'm talking about what drives us. I've been remodeling my kitchen. Like I said, I was breaking out the granite countertops, and I'm out in front, and I've got all the plywood, and I'm sawing and assembling things, and neighbors will walk by, and they'll chat and say, well, where'd you learn to do this, and you must really enjoy this? And I'm like, no. Do you see me? Do you see the bags under my eyes? Do you see how much work this is? No, that's not my motive. I'm not out here because I'm just having a grand old time. You know, what happened was six months ago, there was a small leak in the kitchen. Insurance cut a nice check, and they said we could pay someone, you know, to do shoddy work and uh, use not-so-quality materials and take, you know, eight weeks to rebuild the kitchen, or we could receive the check and I could use quality materials, and I could do it on my own time and save a little money at the same time. That's my motive. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. For Paul, what was his motive in following Jesus? You know, if you practice Christianity at this time, you didn't get accolades. You didn't get a pat on the back. There wasn't popularity. You got the opposite. So you only did this because you truly believed in Jesus, and therefore you were going to live his way. But something very odd was going on in the Corinthian church. I see it as sort of like this whole cowgirl summer vibe that's gone through California this last year. My home has been affected by this pandemic of cowgirl apparel. It was a style in 2023. It was called Coastal Cowgirl. I didn't know that, okay? I had to look it up, but there's a term for the style that's been sweeping through. It's also, you know, hit my house. And guys, you can buy a hat, a cowboy hat right? You can buy some cowboy boots, but do you know what a cowboy really looks like? Do you know what a cowboy and a cowgirl really does when they're out there on the range? If only that show Yellowstone came with a smell, yeah. <laughs> right? Because you're basically taking the most hardworking and rural and filthy of professions and you're turning it into high fashion, you're inverting it to become the opposite of what it actually is. I personally can't wait for plumber girl summer to hit <laughs> very soon here. But similarly, the Christians in Corinth, they were wearing the label of Christian. They were carrying the name of Christ. And they were living the exact opposite of what it means to be a Christian at the core. They were using the name and the message to just further support their own motives and goals of self-expansion. And Paul brings out the contrast and divergence from what Christianity is supposed to be versus what they had turned it into in verse 10. He says, we are fools while you are so wise. Basically, we admit that we are ignorant in ourselves and God knows everything while you go around saying, you know it all. We are weak while you are strong. Basically, we will actually admit to our sins and our weaknesses and our limitations so that you don't trust in us, but that you ultimately trust in God. While you're hiding your faults and projecting perfection and strength to everyone around you. We are dishonored, he says, while you are honored meaning you sell an image of yourself to gain the approval of man. But we put ourselves in the vulnerable position of being despised and rejected by people so that we can win the approval of God. Paul's contrasting attitude here reminds me of something very key that John the Baptist said during his ministry. John was a religious leader in the time of Jesus who lost a lot of his following when Jesus came on the scene. A lot of his disciples began to follow Jesus. And somebody went up to him and said, hey, what's the deal? You're losing your following. Everybody's going after Jesus. What are you going to do about it? 
And John replied in John chapter 3, I'm paraphrasing, he goes, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the one. If life were a wedding, he says, I'm not the groom. I'm the friend of the groom. And when the wedding happens, I'm filled with joy for him. He must become greater. I must become less. In life, we don't experience the heights of joy by robbing attention away from the groom. We experience the heights of joy when we become a friend of the groom and share in the joy of his day. That is, life is Jesus' day. The universe is God's day. What I'm trying to say is life is one big party, and the good news is you and I are invited. But it's not our party. It's God's party. And I'm not going to be the guy who makes someone else's wedding about himself. I don't want you to be the mother of the groom who wears white to compete with the bride at the wedding, right? It's not about you or I. So if our ignorance and our weakness magnifies his brilliance, right? If our honoring him brings us dishonor, if our limitations enhance the view of his strength, then so be it, because he must become greater and we must become less. Every time it becomes about our strength, our smarts, and our honor, the more we find ourselves robbing from his limelight and glory. And I feel that in Christendom, Christian culture. Christendom is its own thing. It's a real beast. I mean, it's massive. It's an institution. It's a machine. And you're hearing a pastor say this. Like, I am admitting to you, this thing is huge. It's a world unto itself. It has its own music industry. It has its own movie industry. It has multiple of its own publishing companies. It's got its own motivational speakers, politicians, and celebrities. Where it is today, Christianity can be a road of magnification for people as much as any other institution or industry. You become just as rich, just as famous, being a pastor or some Christian influencer as much as in any other vocation in the world. And I listen and I watch and I keep wondering, whose wedding is this? Whose wedding is this? We just keep getting greater and greater and greater. And unintentionally or not, Jesus seems to be becoming less and less to us. And what he taught us is also getting less attention. Remember that core teaching for us is his followers. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after my example. What did Paul do? He was called by Jesus, and he says in verse 11, he endured hunger and thirst. He says, I was brutally treated as homeless. He worked with his own hands, which is something anyone that's well-to-do, any one of the higher classes would never do, work with their hands. That's beneath them. When cursed, he blessed. When slandered, he answered with kindness, which is the way of Jesus, but to the rest of the world, just looks like a posture of weakness. He says in summary, verse 13, we become the scum of the earth. We are the garbage of the world. Well, that's not a verse you're ever going to hear cited in a prosperity gospel church. We are the scum of the earth. We are the garbage of the world. That's not a verse you're going to hear much less in most popular American churches. I don't hear anyone chanting the mantra, make Christianity garbage again. You won't see this taught. Because there's no deny yourself taught today. All the messages are affirm yourself. Don't deny yourself, affirm yourself, affirm yourself, and take up that 10-point plan to a better you inspired by the ancient teachings of Jesus. Now, what he told us to pick up is a cross. It's the cross. As he closes out this section, Paul reminds the church he's not trying to shame them with what he's saying. He's trying to build them up. He's trying to give them an accurate picture of reality out of the absurd way that they are representing the faith because he loves them. He wants the best for them. And he appeals to them as one who has a unique place in their life. He holds the distinction of being their spiritual father, right? 
And he's writing as a father who's seeing his kids grow up in the wrong direction. And if you drop Paul into America right now, what would he say to us as our spiritual great, 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 great grandfather? I think he might ask us a few questions, and this is where we're going to end. First question is, why are you here? Why are you here? What's your motivation? You need to start with me. Andrew, why are you here? You know, I can't be tested necessarily in the same way Paul was. There's no way for me to superficially recreate the context of hardship and persecution and beatings that he went through in a state where there's millions of self-proclaimed Christians. I'm just not going destitute. But I can be tempted to go in the other direction, right, to make much of myself. Why are you here, Andrew? Is it about a platform? I'd say I couldn't care less about a platform. I couldn't care less about this. I don't need this. You know, I I don't need, you know, why are you here? Is it to be on social media? Is it so you can go get a meeting with some people who've been published so that you can get your work out there and so you can be invited to speak at cool things? I'm not here for that. That's why I'm not on social media. That's why I don't take a lunch with someone who's been published. I don't care to be published. I don't want to walk that road. That is not what's driving me. That's not why I'm here. And I guarantee you there's not a single person on this staff team or in leadership that's here because they want a platform for themselves or they want some money. They're here because they believe Jesus is the risen Lord and they want to build up his church and follow him as a disciple. Why are you here? Paul would ask you, Paul asked, like, why are you here? What's this about for you? And people say to me, oh, I want to get in church because I want my kids to get good morals. Oh, boy. You know, the church can't make up for the things that you're not doing at home because you're trying to outsource it to the church. You think somebody else is going to put something in your kids that you're not going to put in them? We can't, un- oh, you- why? Why do you want the church to put good morals in your kids? Why do you want your kids to have something that you don't want for yourself? Is it really that valuable? No, but you don't want them to be in trouble so that you don't have the taxation of that on your life. And then they're going to marry someone nice, and that can reflect better on you. It's it's a way that you're greater, right? Why are you here? Oh, I want to listen to good worship and good teaching. Why? Why? Is that so that you can feel something? Is that what this is about? I want to feel good during worship. I want to feel like that was a good thing to listen to. Is it because you want to be entertained? You know why? Oh, I'm here because I want to make friends. Guys, these aren't necessarily bad things. You know, to grow up your kids in the Lord and to hear an edifying teaching, to make friends. Guys, if you stick around long enough, you'll make more than friends. You'll make family in this community. But that's all going to be an outflow, not of you trying to magnify yourself and become greater. But when you get that you're driven, your one motivation is you believe Jesus is the risen Lord of the universe And you want to live your life in line with him. And you want to follow in his example. And when that's your primary motive, and that's what you're here for, I mean, that's what he told us to do. He said, make disciples who obey everything I commanded. And when that's what we're here for, everything else in that outflow falls into place. But it doesn't start with us. It starts with him. And acknowledging his lordship for ourselves and saying, I'm going to walk in that. You know, why are you here is something Paul would ask us. And To get at our motives, he'd probably ask us this too. What do you want? What do you want? Do you want to get or do you want to give? Do you want to rule or do you want to serve? You want to be comfortable or do you want to do the labor of love? You looking to fill yourself up or are you looking to feed those who are hungry around you? Because the Corinthians didn't have this straight. Christianity was just one more way they could just affirm themselves, not deny themselves. He says, don't dress this up and turn this into the opposite of what this is. You're a Christian. Christ, the name, is what you are marked by. And Christ lived in the way of the cross. It's the central core teaching of the name that you are carrying. So as Christians, you have to live the way of the cross. So what do you want? If you're here to get, you're not going to get it. you got to be here to give. If you're here to rule, if that's what you think this is about, Corinthian church, you're totally bad. You're inverting this. This is about service. 
This is about self-giving love, not self-magnification. And that's going to come through denial of self, not affirming yourself. That's what we are. That's our name, and how could we forget it? And how could we turn it into anything else, much less the opposite? Why are you here? What do you want? He'd say, where are you going? Where are you going on the other side of this message, guys? This is not words. It's a walk. We've got a lot of words today. There's a lot of sermons. There's a lot of content, social media, podcasts, books, conferences. You guys ever think, why do we have so much spiritual content? It's because we like that stuff. It's the stuff that gets us to feel things. And guess what? It can also be monetized. But Christianity isn't content. It's conduct. It's conduct. It's a way of life, a way that we live our lives. Paul said the kingdom of God is not words, it's power. And Paul's life had prophetic power because he was living in the truth of Jesus' way. Do you want to walk this walk, or do you want to add to the sea of talk that the world is already drowning in? There's one in here that's listening to this. All right, that unlocked it a little bit. We had something in there. But if that passion would be channeled to the conduct now. You know, and I'm not saying any of this to shame us. I want to say it in the same spirit of Paul. Like, he wants his kids to grow up in the right direction. Let's grow up in the right direction. Let's have the Lord search our hearts around these questions. Would you pray with me as we turn to the Lord as he reveals things that we can't even see for ourselves? Heavenly Father, I I just want to thank you because the grace of the gospel is that we've been invited to the party. I mean, we're we're invited. We're, We're friends of the groom. And there is no higher joy in life. When we try to take center stage and we try to be the one that this is all about, it doesn't work and it won't work. And there is no joy in it. It's empty. It's not what we're suited for. God, you're at the center. Jesus, you're the groom. And when we just take our place as your friend and lift you up, the joy is ours to share. And it's so clear the way that you've given us and yet it gets so confused in the world. Up becomes down and down becomes up and all the spiritual language and all the culture around us. Resort that for us, Jesus. Help us discern why are we here? Why are we here? Man, we might have all these different mixed motives, things that are driving us, things that we're even unaware of. God, would our motive be just so pure? If you're the risen Lord of the universe, then it's our call to obey you, to listen to your words, to not just listen to your words, but apply ourselves to your words to the utmost because you're God. Why did Paul do what he did? Why did he endure all this suffering? He had seen you, the risen Jesus. That was reason enough. There was nothing that was going to get him to stop what he was doing because he was called by you, God. Who's going to argue with God? So, Lord, would that be our motive? That's why we're here, and the rest of it falls into place. Lord, help us understand, what are we looking to get? That might reveal those motives. Are we looking to give or to get? You said it's better to, and more blessed to give than to receive. That's the way of you, Jesus. You came not to be served, but to serve and give your life as a ransom for many. That's, that's what we want. That's what we want, Jesus, not to rule, but to serve as you served. If we're going to carry your name, Jesus, let's not dress up your way into something, making it the opposite of what it actually is. Let's serve like you. We don't want to just affirm ourselves. This whole world is in the business of affirming itself in the way that it's going. Lord, would we deny ourselves so that we can love? When we just affirm ourselves all day long, we just love ourselves. When we deny our own desires, that opens up the opportunity to give to someone else, to love as you loved on the cross. Where are we going, God? Is this just going to be more content? Is this just going to be another sermon? Is this just going to be a podcast pretty soon? More content for the heaps and heaps of content? Or is it going to be conduct? It's a way of life that you've given us. That's why Paul was sent in Timothy so they could see him. 
That's why Paul wanted to go himself because there was a way of life he was living that he was asking others to imitate. Is there a way of life here or is this words? Where are we going? Lord, the kingdom of God, it's not a matter of talk. It's not words. It's power. Prophetic power in the way and the life of Jesus. Would we live into that power? And I just want to invite you in a time of prayer. Would you spend some time? Would you spend some moments right here? I'm going to leave the questions on the screen. Just bring those before the Lord. Let Him purify your heart and soul. It's not to shame you. It's to, it's to build you up in love because... He wants you to grow up in the right direction. So just begin to ask those questions in prayer before the Lord. seeking the Lord's leading this morning and I'm so grateful for the songs that we're going to sing because they put into words exactly what our hearts cry ought to be on the other side of a passage like this and that it would be more than words that it would be a life that we're going to live but would you stand with me as we begin to sing and I'm going to invite the ministry team to the corners of the room here at the front and the back if you need prayer for any reason at all maybe it's something in this message something in your life this is a this is a family. It's a church family. We all want to pray with you. But let's continue to lean in as the Lord purifies our motives and reveals the hidden things in our hearts and as we give more of them to him.
Powerful prayer. Would you extend your hands in a posture of receiving this blessing? God, would there be no question? This is your wedding. Jesus, you're the groom. We're so honored. We're so privileged to be your friend be invited. What a joy it is. What a joy it is, but it's not our day, God. It's your day. It's your day. And would there be no question in our lives and in this branch's community, when the world encounters this community, when the world encounters our own life, would it be so apparent? It's your day. It's about you. It's not about us. God, if it magnifies you, it makes us less, it's it's good. We become less, you become greater, God. Would we be the name, the name of Christ? Would we walk in the way of you, Christ? Would we, would we be a people who can deny ourselves because we love others, because we love you, God? And would we pick up our cross daily and follow after you, not content, conduct, God, following after you day in and day out by your grace? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for letting me bear my soul a little bit there. Uh, Didn't expect that. God bless you guys. What a great journey it's already been.